Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Dr. Go Chi Leong, and uh, I'd like to welcome all of you. Thank you for joining me this afternoon uh, to talk a little bit about uh, real schools and our philosophy of education and how we provide, you know, um, a very unique edge for all of our students to thrive and uh, succeed in uh, this real world, uh, you know, a world that uh, is characterized by the fourth industrial revolution and, and uncertainty and, and lots of challenges. So my name is Dr. Go Chi Leong. I'm the CEO of Real Education. And uh, this afternoon we are having, of course, a very special virtual open day for two of our campuses in uh, Churras, as well as in Johor Bahru. So I'd like to uh, welcome all uh, parents and friends and uh, colleagues who are joining us from both Kuala Lumpur as well as uh, Johor Bahru uh, for this session. Uh, as you know, we've lined up a lot of different exciting events for you today. So after this session, please go and check out our virtual open day pages. Uh, we've got uh, two different pages, one for Churras and one for JB. Uh, so lots of really fun activities, including things like uh, virtual tours, you, know, you, you can arrange a Zoom virtual session with uh, some of our principals, leaders, and teachers. Uh, if you want to find out a little bit more about our schools and what we are doing there, uh, and uh, lots of really interesting videos as well. So uh, do do you know stay with us, uh, you know, pass my session as well, and and take some time to discover our school. Yeah. So uh, as I've mentioned today, I'm going to talk a little bit about. Uh, our own approach to education, uh, which I think is very unique. Uh, I mean, the stress uh, is very much on how we prepare our, our students for the real world. And I think this really came about from, you know, the fact that, um, you know, I've, I've been in education for about 25 years now. And last year, as a leadership team, we spent a long time thinking about, you know, the direction of education, not just here in Malaysia, but also all over the world. And um, I think we realized that education was becoming a little bit disconnected from the realities of the real world. So when we talk to people in business, talk to people in different professions, industries, uh, and we talk to educators themselves. Uh, I think the comment coming back was the fact that uh, maybe, you know, schools by and large all over the world are not preparing children to succeed in the real world and and there are gaps in terms of their competencies in terms of their skill sets and we were also hearing this from parents you know i, I was in the university for 20 over years and so um you know i i had my fair share of conversations with parents who were very worried that their children even though they were close to graduating from university were not ready uh, to be independent not ready to to navigate themselves through this real world. So I think out of that particular context and thinking, uh, last year as a leadership team, uh, you know, the, the leadership team in real schools uh, and, uh, and myself, we sat together and we spent time thinking and reconceptualizing what the school education experience should be like. And so we came up with a whole new curriculum uh, which we call the real world skills curriculum uh, that that encompanies um, you know the the traditional subjects that are that children are learning in our school so of course we do you know stem and and languages and humanities and all the usual stuff but on top of that what we have done is we've actually added an additional curriculum you know called the real world skills curriculum and the idea behind that is we are bringing the real world into the school you know, and so again, rather than, you know, see school as a place where we shelter children from the real world, uh, we see schools as a place where we need to actually expose uh, children and teenagers to the real world uh, and, and in a sense, broaden their worldview so that they have a better understanding of the real world. But also, number two, that they acquire the skill sets and the mindsets that are necessary to, to then strive and survive later on when they go to university as well as when they start work right so uh with with that in mind uh, i want to you know present some ideas uh, about what came out of you know uh those sessions last year 
how have we redefined school? Because to me, I mean, this is really exciting. I mean, I in 25 years of education, I mean, I think this is one of the most exciting projects I've been involved in because, you know, I think the three real schools that we have are really doing a fantastic job in pushing the boundaries of what a school can be and what a school should be. And, and just getting feedback from, you know, the parents that are already in our schools, the staff that are already in our schools, extremely positive because I think they've already been seeing changes in our students as young as from lower primary school, you know, uh, by exposing them to the real world, we've realized that, I mean, they really have the ability to grasp what we're trying to actually teach them. But beyond that, uh, they, they, they've, you know, I mean, don't underestimate how young people can appreciate, uh, you know, uh, this kind of education and preparation, all right? So what I want to do in the next hour is, is very quickly present some ideas we have about what education should be and how we are preparing, you know, your children for the real world. So I start off with, uh, you know, the idea of the fact that the world, of course, has changed. And so when we talk about preparing children for the real world, we need to be conscious of the fact that uh, we are not preparing them for our world, you know, Many of us who are either baby boomers or Gen Xs, uh, you know, I mean, we grew up in the 1970s, 1980s, maybe 1990s as well. And so our frame of reference, when we think about the real world, sometimes if we're not careful, can be actually very historical, uh, you know, and, and we have to realize that, look, I mean, 2020 is not the same as 1980 or 1990. The challenges, you know, the situations, the, the industries, the skill sets that are needed to survive and thrive in today's world are very different from one from what you know uh, we had to develop when we were uh, younger 30 40 years ago so we say that this is a vuca world i mean the term vuca actually stands for volatile uncertain complex ambiguous and i think look uh, now all of us in cmco locked down over the last two months because of a covid crisis that none of us anticipated 3 4 months ago I don't think I need to make the case that we indeed live in a VUCA world. I mean, how many of us, if, if you asked us in, in December, you know, 2019, you know, uh, when we were making New Year resolutions, when most of us were doing business plans for our companies, for our careers, for our businesses and organizations, how many of us would have predicted we are where we are today, you know, uh, just five months later? So, so I certainly, I think the last five months have illustrated just how VUCA the world is how fast the world is to change, you know? So whether it's a business environment, whether it's in this case, a COVID pandemic, uh, you know, the recession, you know, all of these things happen very, very quickly. I mean, you know, I mean, the, the pandemic didn't take one or two years to spread. I mean, it took a month and two months and immediately all of our lives were changed, right? You know, so I think, um, you know, as I've mentioned, uh, this year has illustrated just how VUCA, uh, you know, the world we live in has become, right? Uh, but I think putting aside, you know, one-off events like the COVID-19 crisis, which most people say is a one in, in a 100 year event, you know, um, already before things like COVID-19, we were talking about the VUCA world, you know, more in relation to the fourth industrial revolution. The fact that because of technological advances and the speed of these technical technological advances, you know, um, we lived in a world that was very difficult to predict. And, and I think most, you know, future trend uh, people, you know, I mean, you talk to whether it's it's the Elon Musk of this world or, or, you know, I mean, the Jeff Bezos or, or you know, the Tim Cooks. I mean, uh, most people who are looking ahead uh, will tell you that it's become extremely difficult to predict beyond the next four or five years when it comes to things like technology because the technological advances particularly, you know, in relation to computer technology. Yeah? So we, we talk about quantum computing enabling a lot of things, whether it's VR, artificial intelligence, you know, the Internet of Things, you know, brain machine interface, nanotechnology, data analytics. I mean, all of these are examples of some of the moving pieces that are driving the fourth industrial revolution. But they're happening at such a pace that even the experts are telling us that you can't, it, it's difficult to predict beyond the next four or five years, you know? So, so um, I think this is interesting. And, and I, I start with this as an introduction because this is therefore the kind of world that our children are going to be growing up in. 
they're going to be growing up in a world where you know the way they work whatever industry they choose to be in uh, any industry whether it's medicine or engineering or law or business or entrepreneurship or education or anything you know um you find that this fourth industrial revolution is going to have an impact on how they work and how we live all right you know um you know um very very quickly but but you know beyond just their work it, it's also going to impact the way they live and the way they learn and and you know the way they relate to one another all right so we talk about the future of work yeah? um and these are again some of these examples that illustrate uh, just how fast the world is changing you know um world economic forum predicts that 65 percent of school students will be employed in jobs that don't exist today you know so it's it's incredibly difficult to predict what our children are going to end up doing in the next you know 10 20 years when they graduate from university because you know the pace of change again is is incredible all right so so i i think it's in this context where you know it's a vuca world very volatile lots of technology lots of changes you know and then once in a while you throw in a crisis like covid-19 and so you've got this very challenging world environment that that is different from the environment we grew we grew up in in the 1980s and 90s where the things were a lot more stable you know it was a lot easier to predict things uh, and so now in this fast changing environment we realize that our children the next generation of students need slightly different skill sets in order to survive and thrive and so this is where real schools have put together i think a very unique education experience and a very unique school culture that that will help your children develop these 10 uh, what we call real world skills all right so let me go through uh, these skills with you one by one so number one of course we talk about adaptability the idea that in order to survive and thrive in a vuca world our children will need to be incredibly flexible and and here we're talking about flexibility of mind the ability to accept change the ability to roll with these changes uh you know there was a chinese you know saying that says we need to be like water to be successful in business in life we be like water because water you know has a property that is in you know completely fluid water can bend and adapt to any kind of shape any kind of circumstance you know and and in a sense in a vuca environment our children will need this kind of skill set and mindset you know so rather than being very rigid very fixed where they are set in working a certain way living a certain way they need to be a lot more fluid agile adaptable flexible all right and and part of that is teaching them how to problem solve teaching them you know how to to you know uh, confront a particular challenge that is in front of them and and learn how to overcome them i think related to that this ability to adapt to changes is the idea of having an internal locus of control you know so so this is about children uh you know soon to be young adults when they are confronted with a challenging situation you know uh, very quickly they are able to sum up what are the factors that are beyond their control and what are the factors that are within their control and of course we we always say good leaders you know good entrepreneurs good business people uh you know good professionals they focus on what they are able to control so they don't waste a lot of time and moaning and groaning about things that they can't control so i mean case in point is currently right now the mco covid lockdown you know i mean we can't control the fact that there was a covid pandemic we can't most of us can't control you know just how long the cmco or mco period is going to last when can businesses open up when will schools begin again you know uh, when can life go back to normal you know and 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 so a lot of these things are not under our control but what we can control is what we do within these parameters you know so i may not be able to control the fact that i can't get out of my house but i mean what i choose to do in my house i can control how i choose to reorganize my house to make it a more conducive work environment or learning environment for my children or a play environment so that my children don't get bored now that's under my control how i used to manage my time how i i choose to you know readapt my work habits so that i'm able to be as effective working from home 
as I am in, in the office. Now, all of these things are within my control. You know, so I think that's really you know, what we mean by having an internal locus of control. I think the, the, the point behind this is that a lot of people you know, feel very helpless in their lives. And this sense of helplessness uh, sometimes renders them ineffective. You know, uh, they, are, they are not able to take agency and power over their work and over their lives. And, and, and so sometimes that makes them not so productive. You know, they are not able to think around problems, uh, you know, and a lot of times because they feel powerless, because they feel that, look, I can't do anything about the situation, they tend to be quite passive. Yeah. All right. And uh, so I think moving ahead, I mean, we want our children not to be passive. We want them to be proactive. We want them to, to have this sense of control over their lives and their fate, you know, so that they become successful young adults. Uh, successful, you know, professionals, workers, leaders, but also in their personal lives, I mean, successful husbands and wives, you know, fathers, mothers, you know, uh, friends, you know, in all spheres of their life, they have this sense of, you know, I, I want to, you know, focus on what I can do rather than complaining about what I can't do. And because my focus is uh, on things that are within my power, I'm less likely to be frustrated. I'm less likely to be stressed. You know, I'm less likely to, to feel helpless or powerless, right? So this internal locus of control, this, this kind of mindset, I think is very, very important for children, you know, uh, for the, this next generation in, in the Bukha world. Uh, I, you know, I, I talk a lot about a book that I, I read, I think when I first started working, this must have been in the, in the late 90s, the mid or late 90s, called Who Moved My Cheese? And, uh, you know, those of you who have read the book know that this is a short parable, you know, it's sort of like a, 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 a short story, you know, it, it's a fantastical story. Um, and it talks about a maze where a group of human beings and a group of rats sort of live together in this maze. And, uh, you know, every day at a certain time, they go to a part of the maze where somebody feeds them cheese, you know, so, uh, gives them food for sustenance. And uh, it's the same time and the same place every day. And so this becomes sort of a habit and a ritual. And so one day they turn up at this given place at that given time. But something changes on that day because there's no cheese, right? And the rest of the book basically tracks the reaction of the human beings versus the rats. And you see the rats immediately, you know, when they see that there's no cheese in that spot on the maze, they they run off and you know they, they keep searching in other parts of the maze and within a few minutes they sort of find the tree somewhere else right the human beings on the other hand they sort of sit, sit there and they moan and they groan and they complain and they sort of go into this huge deep philosophical arguments about it's not fair you know why have they moved the cheese who moved my cheese you know what's happening here and and basically you know um they take the 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 choice of inaction, right? And, and you know, uh, th this idea of, you know, complaining about something that they're not in control of rather than actually being very action-oriented oriented or, or problem, you know, uh, oriented and, and, you know, focusing on what they can do at this stage. They sort of sit there and complain about why the cheese is not delivered to them at that given time and place. And, and I guess, you know, it, it's a myth. I know a lot of business people at that time read this book and, you know, uh, I, I know our bosses used to give it to us to read. And I think it, it, it just puts forward this simple but powerful point that I mean to be successful in any kind of work, any kind of profession, there needs to be this agency, like, there needs to be this action-orientedness, um, you know, uh, and rather than, like I say, you know, blaming or spending a lot of time arguing about what is fair and what is not fair because as i tell my children life often is not going to be fair and so i mean if if, if you you're going to spend most of your life you know arguing about what is fair not fair i mean i i can tell you you know 50 percent of our life is going to be wasted because uh you know we, we can tell you right now a lot of times you know things that happen in life are very arbitrary and very unfair i mean COVID 19 i mean you know was this fair you know i mean the people who lost their lives, the people who had their livelihood stolen, I mean, was it fair on them? No, I mean, did, did they do anything to deserve uh, COVID-19? Of course not, you know, but, but we have to realize that things happen, you know, so whether you call it, you know, random chance or whether it's, 
It's just happening. Uh, it, it's not about us questioning why things are happening. It's about us being fluid, adaptive, and in this case, you know, um, having, I, I guess, you know, the agency to look within ourselves and ask ourselves, when something bad happens, how do I actually respond and react to it? So rather than, you know, try to explain, um, because in some cases, I can tell you there is no explanation. I mean, there's no rhyme and reason for why good or bad things happen. Uh, rather than that, to, to sort of think, you know, what is the next step? What can I do in this situation? What is within my power? And people who think like that, who are very action oriented, they tend to therefore roll with the punches a lot better when, when things happen, unexpected things happen, you know, shocks, uh, you know, uh, surprises. They tend to recover a lot faster. And within organizations, it's great to have these people around because they are the ones in a, in a, in a time of crisis, in a time of emergency, they are the ones who sort of save the rest of us. You know, because rather than waste time, like I say, thinking too much, overthinking things, you know, they, they tend to, you know, very quickly, well, they, they are, it's not as though they're not thinking, but their focus of their thoughts are on what do we do next? So they are very thoughtful. Like, it's not as though they are, you know, brainless. I mean, they are very thoughtful, but the focus of their thoughts are on, you know, what can I do in this situation? What are my options? What action can I take? And, you know, let's make a decision and let's do it. All right. So just like the rats, they quickly, you know, the rat, the cheese is not there. They quickly decide to go and search some elsewhere. They find their cheese and, and you know, they are successful. Okay, number three, we talk about independence, all right? The ability to look after uh, ourselves. Uh, and of course, for, I think parents, this is this is the big one. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a father myself. I've got, you know, a teenager who is just about to go to university and, and a younger son. And I can tell you, my wife and I, I think to us, this is really one of the key focuses. I mean, we want our children to have the skill sets to be able to look after themselves so that they're not dependent. And, and 18, 19, they are still not dependent on us, you know. They have the courage and the confidence to actually go out there and live their own lives, you know. And, and so whatever career they pick, whatever university they end up going to, I mean, you know, that's, that's irrelevant in a sense. As long as they've got independent skills, then I, as a father, am confident that my children will succeed, you know. So that's why I, I'm less concerned about the specific choices that they actually make in their life. I mean, do they choose to go to university or, you know, drop out and start a business? You know, what do they choose to study in university? Where do they choose to go to university, abroad or locally? What kind of jobs do they choose to do? What career pathway do they pick? You know, what kind of companies do they choose to work with? Or do they choose to start their own business? Do they migrate to another country? Do they stay in Malaysia? You know, do they get married early or later? You know, all of these stuff, huh? I mean, in the end of the day, as a father, I realize I'm, you know, when they are 18, 21 and older, they need to be in a position to make these decisions by themselves. And as a father, I mean, I can advise, I'm happy to be like an external consultant, you know, coming in, giving them some feedback and ideas, being there, shoulder to cry on, you know, whenever they need to bounce ideas off me, I'm here. But my point is, I, I can't be there making the decisions for them, you know. Because it's not my life that they are living, right? They need to learn to live their own lives. And so because of that, uh, I think the, this idea of independence is so important to us as parents, right? So we want children who are equipped with the skills so that they can look after themselves, right? They're, they're not going to get bullied. They're not going to get lost. They're not going to get tossed, you know, and turned in, in the storm. You know, they're going to have the strength to stand their ground know what they want in their life, you know, and actually know what it takes to go and get that. And of course, you know, I, I put in this slide some examples of some of these independent skills, so things like financial literacy. So, I mean, I, I don't want my children to go bankrupt, you know, within the first two, three years of working. I mean, uh, you see, this is a big problem all over the world, but in Malaysia, you know, I, I remember when I was back in the psychology department at the university, and I mean, we were in touch with uh, people like Bang Nagara and all of that, and they show us the statistics. It's incredibly, incredibly scary. Eh? You know, I mean, just how many young adults are in debt within one or two years of starting work? You know, and it's not just in debt because they're buying a house or a car, which are, I guess are necessary. But I mean, you know, they are in debt because they are spending way more than they can afford. You know, they they have no sense of financial management. Eh? You know, 
And so they get the credit card. They are so excited. Money in their pockets for the first time they go out there. You know, they, they are living way beyond their means, you know. And I guess this is also linked to, a, you know, being overly materialistic, you know. So when they're not careful, when they are too swayed by peer pressure, you know, they need to buy expensive stuff. They, they need to live beyond what they can afford. You know, and they're not prudent and responsible and disciplined in their spending. Then this is what happens. You know, so so I mean, I want my child to be in economically independent, which means that they need to learn to have the discipline to save. They need to be able to do the mat basic mathematics every month, all right? Of knowing how much they are earning, you know, and how much they are allowed to spend, and and how much they should be saving for their future. You know, so the, these kind of skills, which to be honest, many of us did, did never learn in school. Eh? You know, and, and so, so we were learning things like accounting and all of that. But to be honest, I think what would have been really useful for all of us is if all of us actually did financial literacy and financial management. So that these are the kind of things we've actually made compulsory in real schools. So all of our students at some point are going to be going through a financial literacy course, right? And that will teach them, you know, uh, to have a right attitude towards money and, and, and spending. Uh, but also things like physical and mental health, you know, I mean, this is something I know um, many young adults neglect, you know. So when I look at young working adults, some of them, I mean, they're, they're very smart, very capable, but I mean, they're sick all the time. They're on MCs all the time. They can't look after themselves, you know. They, they lack the, what I would say, the mental stamina, you know. So cannot tahan one. I mean, they, they cannot last long meetings beyond, let's say, three, four hours. Their concentration levels are so short. And largely it's because, you know, physically they're unfit. So we talk about healthy body, healthy mind. Eh? And so, uh, you know, when I'm going into real schools and street KDU schools and I'm talking to our own students about SPM and IGCSE and exam prep, and I say, well, you, you want to be able to study longer? First thing is be fit. Make sure that you're exercising regularly, eating well, not overeating, not under eating, getting enough rest, because that's going to then guarantee that your brain is strong enough and, and alert enough to be able to concentrate for three, four, five hours at a time, you know? And, and I think this is really important. So physical and mental health, this is important, you know? Of course, mental health is something close to my heart. I mean, my background is a psychologist, you know? So I, I want my children to know how to look after their mental health, you know, to know when they need help, to make sure that they've got social support so that they're not all alone. And, and when they're lonely, when they're stressed, when you know, they're having a breakdown when they're burned out, you know, they, 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 they have, I guess, the courage and they are willing to put aside their sense of pride and ego sometimes to actually go and get help. And they know where to get help, you know, and they know what the warning signs are so that when they are actually not coping with life and look, I mean, everybody will find themselves at some point in their lives in a difficult circumstance. You know, when they are in that situation, they know how to actually get support. And they're not going to try to be heroes by themselves and sort of burn out, you know, or worse, because, you know, they don't have the basic mental health skills. So all of our students in real schools will actually have some form of psychological training, you know, some sort of mental health training to help them look after themselves. So things like that, like making adult decisions. I talked about that earlier. You know, I mean, I, I want children to learn how to weigh up options, you know, so, so, so that, you know, when they are 12 or 13, they are already beginning to learn to make small decisions in their life, how to manage their time, how to choose friends, you know, how, how to, you know, uh, uh, pick uh, things like extracurricular activities that may match their own interests and their own personal development, you know, uh, and, and, and things like that. Because, you know, I often tell parents uh, and I, 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 I get a lot of parents come up to me and, you know, they, they say, hey, look, my 20 year old, my you know, 22-year-old university grad son or daughter. I'm so worried about them because they, they can't make decisions. They don't know how to make decisions. So the parents always feel that they have to go in there and sort of baby them and make decisions for them. And I say, look, you know, but that's the problem, you see, because you've been babying them their whole lives. So at, you know, nine years old, you don't even let them pick what, you know, clothes to wear. And at 11 years old, you don't even let them pick their hairstyle. You know, at 12 years old, you don't even let them choose their friends. You know, uh, at 13, you don't even allow them to actually make decisions about how to manage their time, you know. Then how do you expect them at 18 to suddenly wake up one day and be able to make a lifelong decision like a career pathway or what to study in university? You know, how do you expect your 25, 26-year-old to be able to, you know, decide, you know, whether they want to get married or not, who to marry, where to live, companies to go to? I mean, no way, you know, I mean, these skills are developed over time. So I, I think we always talk about parents and schools 
about not overprotecting your child to the point where they are not able to make decisions for themselves. Decision making requires practice, like anything in life. It's a skill that if you want to master, you have to try it out. And so as parents, we need to you know, give them some room. As educators, we need to give students some room to make decisions. And you know what? Sometimes they're going to make this, uh, bad decisions and mistakes, and that's fine because you know, we, we, in school, we give them a safe environment to try things, to experiment things. And even when they fail and when things go wrong, at least it's not life-threatening. It, it's not something that is going to have long-term repercussions. But it's a good incubator lab where they learn how to make decisions, right? And so real schools, that's our culture. I mean, we are not there to treat your kids like babies. We're not there to spoon feed them. You know, we, we want them to grow up. And to grow up, they need to be given a little bit more freedom every year as, as they become older and older so that, you know, they, they, they really, you know, are able to grab some of these skills, right? So th even things like personal health and safety. So for example, all of our secondary school students will be first aid certified. So all of them will learn things like CPR and how to treat wounds and, and you know, prevent infection and all of that and, and this is basic stuff you know i mean if i my way i think this would be taught in, in all schools all over the world because these are the practical skills you know not not so much academic you know, textbook knowledge these are stuff that is going to actually save their lives and save the lives of their friends when you know in a few years time they're hiking somewhere or there's an accident on the road and you know and, and somebody is really hurt and they know what to do in an emergency situation like that so whether it's they themselves that need the treatment or they are helping treat somebody else. I mean, these are the kinds of people that are useful citizens that are going to make a huge impact in the world and be able to succeed in the world. And also survival skills. So, so uh, I, you know, we, we want to make sure that I, I know now kids are very indoors, you know, well, certainly during the lockdown, everybody is indoors and, you know, sort of glued to their technology. And so we want to balance. I mean, we are a very technological savvy school. Later on, I'll talk about the fact that we are an Apple city. So, you know, we are an Apple one-to-one -one school, one of the few, you know, in, in Malaysia to be that. But at the same time, we want to balance, you know. So and on one hand, we want them to be technologically savvy because fourth industrial revolution ready. On the other hand, we want them to love nature. We want them to be out there. So all of our students in real will have to go camping, right? All of them will have to go and learn how to pitch a tent. They will have to learn how to make a fire, campfire, you know, by themselves, learn how to read a map learn how to read a compass, you know, all of these things, uh, wilderness survival skills, yeah, I think really important. I, I think number one, because we happen to be blessed to live in Malaysia, which is one of the most naturally beautiful countries in the world. I mean, we are blessed with so much nature, you know, whether it's the forests and the, 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 the oceans, the sea, the, you know, I mean, we're just surrounded by so much nature. And, 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 and so we want our real school, school students to grow up appreciating the beauty of nature. Right. And, and uh, I, I think this is something fantastic. I mean, our Chura school, you know, I mean, it's right in Ulu Langa. I mean, it's it's located right at the heart of the largest natural reserve in the Klang Valley. Uh, you know, all of the picnic spots, the fishing spots, the camping spots are literally five, ten minutes from the road Chura school. I think it's incredible advantage that they have that, you know, so so part of their PE lessons and all that, they actually go go and do camping, which is fantastic, you know. Uh, and the JB school is not that far away as well uh, from Desaru and, you know, the seaside resorts and all of that. So I think it's wonderful that our schools firstly are green themselves. So they've got trees and all of that to remind them of nature. But also, you know, we are, we are not very far away from beautiful natural reserves. And, and so we want to teach all of our students to do, you know, things like survival skills in the wilderness, which I think many adults like myself we, we, we really worry that our kids are too indoors, a bit too pampered. You know, some of them, uh, you take away the air con or so they cannot survive. I mean, macha mana, man, you know. So how to survive in the real world? So they need to toughen up a little bit. Eh? So sending them out into the jungle, a bit of like outward bound kind of stuff. I think that's really important. And that's very much part of our real school philosophy, right? But also it's, it's about taking responsibility for their lives. And so the tip that I would give parents during this MCO is, this is a golden opportunity to teach your kids when good if the maid is not there, you know, teach them how to clean up their own, you know, rooms and mop and sweep and wash their own clothes and, you know, uh, dry their own clothes and, you know, fold their own clothes and manage their own studies and all of these things. You know, th this is the opportunity to actually push up their independence level by about 25, 30% during this lockdown period. Now, you know, it's a wonderful opportunity to, make them a bit more self-sufficient, right? 
So that's number three. Number four, talk a little bit about intellectual curiosity. So, so this is, you know, for those of you who have just joined us, we're talking about, you know, what are the skill sets that we give to students and children so that in real schools, we prepare them to survive in the real world. So number four is a, a mental skill. So intellectual curiosity is thinking skill. And I think, I'm sure you've heard this a lot of times uh, where, you know, you talk to employers and a lot of bosses and a lot of leaders and they say, oh, you know, this newer generation, they come out, you know, a lot of these new employees, you know, new staff join the organization. The complaint is these people cannot think. You know, they cannot think for themselves, you know, they need to be spoon fed, they need to be told, you know, um, you know, instructions, you know, um, you know, uh, if not, they can't do something. And, and, and I guess, you know, what a lot of organizations, you know, really mean by this critique and this observation is that a lot of, a lot of graduates coming out of universities nowadays, I think they, they fail to show intellectual curiosity. Like, which is basically this hunger for knowledge and information. This hunger that I want to go and find out things. I'm going to learn things. I'm hungry to learn new skills, new information, new knowledge. You know, I don't understand something great. I'll, I'll go and read it up. I'll look at it on, on you know, Google. I'll go and watch a TED Talk on YouTube, you know. But, but that hunger to master information, uh, as opposed to people without this intellectual curiosity, just sit there, like, don't know, means don't know, like. You know, look at the boss very blankly, very blur. Everything also don't know. I don't know this one, boss. I don't know that one, boss. Tell me what to do, boss. You know, so I think that that's what that noise. A lot of uh, bosses or more experienced workers out there. Uh, come on, man. You know, you need to be a bit more independent in terms of your thinking, right? You know, if you don't know something, then go and learn it yourself. You know, and and I I, I often tell parents that the irony is that this intellectual curiosity is actually inborn. It's not something that needs to be motivated by a teacher or a parent or, or you know an employer it, you know when the child is first born all of us have this intellectual curiosity because our brains this is an evolutionary psychology function eh? our brains are designed to soak up information so that, that that's the way it is our brains are there to soak up a lot of information why because survival of the fittest you know, if the animal or the human being is not able to master the environment, uh, you know, like in the, in, you know, for animals in the jungle, you don't know what's dangerous, what's not dangerous, what you can eat, what you can't eat, you know, where you should go, why, where you shouldn't wander around. I mean, you will die within a few days you know, because the jungle is a dangerous place to be in. So this brain instinct is to very quickly figure out, explore the environment so that immediately you learn about, you know, how to survive in this environment. So this, this is what feeds this natural intellectual curiosity and that explains why i mean young children i mean if you notice from the time they can speak you know in fact even before the time they can speak i mean when they can crawl around at seven eight months i mean these kids you put them in any environment you know these babies will crawl around and they'll touch things they'll put things in their mouth they will you know i mean you know they, they'll really explore without being told and then when they can speak later on they bombard you with all kinds of questions like 101 questions about everything, about science, about, you know, motos, about electricity, about the internet, about politics, about people, about, you know, they've got 101 questions. And this is good. So we tell parents that this is, this is something that you should protect. This instinct that your child has to learn. I want to find out more. And, and so that's why Papa and Mommy, I'm asking you these questions. So, so my, my tip for parents is always when children ask you questions at any age, always take this, the question seriously. Never bat it aside. Even if you don't know the answer, then go and find out. You know, I mean, go go and actually take time. You know, and and now with the internet, I mean, with your handphone, I mean, you can basically Wikipedia or Google almost anything, isn't it? You know, so take time and go and find out that information. But together, or if you've got older children, teach them how to find the information for themselves. So show them how to do research, whether it's on the internet or or go to the library or whatever it is. You know, so so that they can find out for themselves how to answer these questions. Okay, so so I think in real schools, this is a philosophy we actually feed uh, into very much as well. Uh, you know, so our teachers, uh, ourselves, you know, we, we see ourselves as facilitators. We are not there to spoon feed kids. Of course, we teach. You know, make sure that the, they they have the knowledge that they need. But more importantly, we are actually teaching them how to fish for themselves, right? 
So rather than give them fish, we want to give them the tools to fish for themselves. So the tools to learn for themselves. All right. Um, what you see in, in this diagram is something called Bloom's Taxonomy. This is something that all educators and teachers will learn in teachers training college. Uh, you know, it, it's a hierarchy. It goes from bottom up and, and it, it's a hierarchy that defines, in a sense, the different depths of learning. All right. So it begins with very superficial learning, which is just remembering facts and information. And then you go a bit higher, you understand, and then you can apply the information, analyze, evaluate, create, you know, and part of that is synthesis as well. You know, so, so I think a good education system, preparing children for a VUCA world, we are actually pushing them from the bottom to the top, all right? And it's very important, therefore, that we should see a progression and that kids, you know, are not stuck at just memorizing information. That's why you hear a lot of educators that talk about the fact that, you know, I mean, we need to be careful not to become just, a, you know, a, a tuition center that is preparing kids, you know, for exams. Now, I think we do that very well. I mean, our students at real schools do very well in their exams. But I think the way of successfully preparing them for examination success is not spoon feeding. It's actually giving them the skills to learn for themselves. So that lifelong, they are able to do it without the teacher, without the tuition teacher, without the workbook, without the past year questions. These kids forever have the skill to be able to learn knowledge. Right? Li Ka Sheng, I mean, you know, of course, he was known to be a very thoughtful sort of philosopher, CEO, you know, talked about the fact that in this day and age, where because of the internet, information is so freely available, right? The information, all the data, all of the analysis, the facts are all there. All the research is there, available for everybody. You know, it's the person that is able to join the dots, right? So synthesis is being able to firstly identify what are the relevant data that I need and information that I need. What are the questions I should be asking? Where should I be searching for the data? And once I've got the data, how do I connect all of these dots, the trends analysis? So that's why, I mean, good entrepreneurs do that one, right? They look at trends, trends in technology, trends in demographics, trends in politics. They look at, you know, social dem demographic trends and shifts. They look at economic trends. They look at, you know, uh, you know, potential threats like the COVID-19 crisis. They look at all of these things. They put all of these things together and that's why their business is ready, you know. And, and that's why, you know, they are able to identify a business model or a business need or a product need. Or service need that the rest of us can't see, you know, because some people have that gift of joining the dots, right? So, so uh, this is something that we in real want to teach all of our students to be able to do, so that you know, in this data analytics world, they are able to actually think for themselves. You know, uh, we say that uh, we believe our children's minds are like compasses, right? So in real schools, we teach them how to read the compass. So that in this sea of information, which is sort of like the internet, this knowledge, you know, economy, yeah, they are able to ensure that they don't get lost. Their brains become a, a reliable compass that points them in the right direction so that they're not sort of lost. Um, you know, and, and I think we are moving towards this away from the analogy that the student's mind is just an empty cup and therefore we just fill them with a lot of information to memorize. I mean, you know, memory learning is, is an important part, but learning of facts is an important part of education, but it's not the focus. Right? So I think in this internet age, it's about making that shift. And that's something that we are doing in real schools. Okay, moving on to number five, resilience. Eh? So I think we realize in a VUCA world, they need to be able to handle stress. So they need to be tough. Mentally, they need to be tough. You know, so things like the COVID crisis has shown, you know, uh, I think in the world, I mean, it's it's incredibly difficult. People are losing jobs, you know, businesses are going bankrupt, you know, uh, I mean, uh, not to even mention the loss of life, you know, uh, many families are losing loved ones. And so, I mean, in this very trying, challenging environment, you know, in order to sort of survive and thrive, you need a level of mental hardness, isn't it? It's a resilience, you know, and by that, I just want to be clear. I mean, it doesn't mean that you don't feel hurt. It doesn't mean you don't feel stressed. It doesn't mean you don't feel depressed. You don't feel sad. I mean, all of these are very natural emotions. So a lot of people mis misunderstand. Now, they think strength means you don't feel anything at all. You know, some people think that to be strong means nothing affects you in life. And, and that's furthest from the truth. 
I mean, we are all human beings. And as human beings, of course, we feel. We feel stressed, we feel concerned, we feel worried, you know. It, it's very much part of being a human being. But, you know, resilience means that in spite of my stress, I'm still able to then survive and function. I'm still able to work. I'm still able to get up. When I go through disappointments, of course, I feel the disappointment. I may feel angry, frustrated, you know. But in spite of my anger and frustration, I'm still able to overcome this and move on and learn from my disappointment and rise up even stronger. You know? So I, th I think that's what we mean by resilience. It's not about being invulnerable or, you know, I mean, being Superman. I mean, no, nobody's like that, you know. All of us are human beings. We have vulnerabilities. But in spite of our vulnerabilities, it's about having the ability to bounce back. You know? So when life hits you down, it, it's about saying, okay, how do I manage this? And how do I find within myself and my social support system how do I find the resources for me to actually keep moving on, right? So I think this is so important, and this is something that we actually teach in real schools as well. Um, I want to move on. All right, I like this quote very much. I mean, Helen Keller, uh, you know, uh, who of course very young in life became both blind as well as deaf, and and went through an incredibly challenging experience growing up and being educated, uh, and eventually, I mean, became such an inspiration to everybody, right? Because she was able to, you know, in a sense, overcome those difficult, genuine challenges to become such an accomplished person that was an inspiration to so many other people around the world. And, and I like this quote, life is either a daring adventure or nothing at all. And I think this is the kind of mindset that we want in real school students. You know, this courage to say, look, life is not going to be easy. You know, I mean, Forget about it. I mean, there's no way life will be easy. Whatever pathway you choose in life, there are going to be challenges. and There are going to be setbacks. But it's about what you do when you face these setbacks. And to Helen Keller, you see it as an adventure. You don't see it as something negative. You see it as something that, in a sense, makes life exciting and unpredictable and brings out the best in you, not the worst in you. Right? Number six, they talk about emotional intelligence. So, you know, in order to survive and thrive in this world, you know, uh, we want our children to be firstly able to manage their own emotions, but also to be good at managing the emotions of other people. And, and that means that they're able to also work well with others, right? So, for example, I mean, in EQ, uh, just to do a quick one minute lesson, there are three basic skills in emotional intelligence, right? So, one is being able to identify our emotions. So, do, am I sensitive enough to know how I'm feeling? You know, am I stressed? Am I angry? Am I disappointed? Am I happy? Am I bored? Am I tired? You know, so many, many different emotions we feel at any given time. So my sensitivity and ability to correctly label what I'm feeling, that's step one. And that's already very difficult to do eh? because even as adults, I mean, you notice many times we actually mistake emotions. Sometimes we think we're angry when we're actually disappointed you know, and, 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 you know, that kind of thing, right? Number two is being able to understand why we feel that emotion. So what is the root cause of that emotion? So if I'm feeling, let's say, angry or, or frustrated, what is causing that anger and frustration? Who am I angry with? You know, and, and so sometimes it may be myself. You know, maybe I'm angry at myself, even though I might be lashing out at everybody and throwing a tantrum and shouting at everybody. Actually, maybe it's not my staff that I'm angry with or it's not my boss, or it's not the customer, or it's not my children, or my husband, or my wife. Maybe it's me, you know? And, and so I think, you know, um, number two, the second skill in, in EQ is about, you know, having an accurate understanding of why I'm feeling a certain thing. So whether I'm stressed, or angry, or frustrated, where is that emotion coming from? And same thing in a number, with number three, which is, then once I understand the root cause of that emotion, then I'm made, better able to manage that emotion. Right, so identifying the emotion, understanding the emotion, managing the emotion. These, in a nutshell, it is actually EQ. You do these three things yourself, you know. And and this, these are skills that we are teaching our students in real schools, which we think will give them a real edge next time when they are grown up, you know. Because a lot of adults are terrible at this, uh, you know. A lot of adults cannot manage stress, cannot manage frustration and anger. You know, they are so hot tempered. You know, very short fuse. So this makes them, you know. Uh, not assets in an organization, in a team. So having these skills, you know, make, make you a much better team worker. And this brings me to my point number seven, 
So the seven skill, real world skill that will help our children survive in the real world is collaboration. So this is the seventh thing that we teach in real schools, which is how, you know, how to really get along with other people, right? How to be part of a team, how, you know, to bring out the best in other people versus bring out the worst. And, and you know, I think as adults, we realize how important this is. I mean, think about the last time. I mean, those of you who are in business or in leadership in organizations, when you were hiring a staff and you were interviewing a staff, you were thinking, is this staff going to fit in well with the rest of my team, the rest of the organization, the rest of this department? Or if you're hiring for a leadership position, you know, you're asking yourself, if this leader comes in, is everybody else going to resign and retire? Or is this person going to be good at actually coaching and bringing up the skill level of the rest? And, and I think this is really important, you know. So a good team player brings out the best in other people. And, and so, you know, this is a skill that we teach in real. That's why in real schools, a lot of what we do in the classrooms, you know, homework assignments, projects, uh, club societies, extracurricular activities, all of these things we actually do in teams. And we do it purposely because that's the only way that therefore our children and students are able to acquire this skill set of how to collaborate and how to work with one another, right? Number eight, the eighth skill that real schools teach to prepare children for the real world is digital mindedness. And uh, I want to stress this is not just for the IT industry, right? You know, so this is not just, you know, this is not just, um, you know, preparing children because, you know, um, because they, what do you call it? You know, because they, uh, they want to work for Google or Amazon or Facebook. I mean, look, we know, you know, I mean, it's not as though 100% of the children are going to end up working in IT. But we say this, eh? there's no industry in the world right now. There's no profession in the world, any profession that is untouched by technology. You take any, even the traditional professions, medical science, people who are doctors. I mean, you go to most hospitals, you know, whether it's doing surgery or diagnosis, of course, they have to use technology. Technology is a fundamental part now of what they are doing. You know, whether it's using robotics to actually perform the surgery or using, you know, all of this latest technology and computer imaging systems, AI systems to actually find out what's wrong with the patient, you know. Technology is very much part of medical science, you know. Same thing with engineering, same thing with, with uh, you know, uh, with architecture, same thing with, with business. I mean, you think of which company is not affected by technology, you know, whether it, it's accounting software or finance software or CRM systems or, you know, knowledge management solutions. I mean, all of this relies so intensely on technology helping us grow our businesses make work more efficient, right? Automate systems, processes, manufacturing, of course, I mean, it's incredibly tech-focused, you know, and tech-savvy. So, so I think, you know, whatever industry you're in, uh, even in education, I mean, now during this MCO, we are realizing how important technology is in teaching, right? Uh, I mean, we were fortunate enough, we are an Apple one-to-one -one school, so we introduced Apple iPads to all of our students and staff, you know, just a few months before the MCO lockdown. You know, uh, for our international schools, we started last year. For the national schools, we started in January, February. It was just in time. And thank goodness for that, because, I mean, without those iPads, I mean, I, I, I you know, I can't, I, I can't imagine how we would have been able to manage our virtual classrooms, our online learning during this last two and a half months. And so I'm, I'm so grateful for the schools and the teachers. They've done a, a wonderful job at learning how to use technology in education to actually teach our students. And the students have been fantastic. Of course, in many ways, you know, often the students actually learn faster than us adults. You know, they are, they are, you give them an iPad, you know, instinctively, uh, these people are group, uh, digital generation. You know, they, they master things so quickly, you know, whether it's how to use, conf, uh, you know, Google Hangouts or Zoom conferences or, you know, uh, you know, online assessment, you know, I mean, they, they're making videos and all kinds of things doing, you know, FaceTime with one another. So it's amazing, right? But, but, I, I think this last two months have illustrated how important technology is across the board. You know, technology now makes the world tick whether we like it or not. So when we talk about digital mindedness, uh, I want to make very clear, we are not just talking about teaching students technical skills, which we do very well. So we've got a digital mindedness, digital tech program 
for all of our students in real schools from year one all the way up to when they finish. And every you know year, every month, they're getting certain challenges that will help them in a sense, expand their, their, their tech knowledge. Now, of course, because we're an iPads, you know, a one-to-one -one iPad school, all of them have the technology every day. So every day they're already using the technology to learn geography and science and history and English and all kinds of things. So they are very technological savvy people, uh, students are in real. But beyond that, I want to stress, it's not just a technical skill, you see, because learning how to do coding and programming is easy to teach. I mean, that one that we can teach in a few weeks, no problem. But beyond that, it's about teaching them an appreciation of the potential of technology, the, uh, the potential of this fourth industrial revolution. So we've got projects where they do social media, digital marketing, where they look at, you know, design, uh, you know, they look at production. Eh? So video production, audio visual production using their iPads. They, of course, do coding, programming. Uh, they're looking at app design, you know, and later on, when they are a bit older, they, they are even going to construct their own VR programs, artificial, uh, you know, virtual reality, augmented reality, you know. So, so uh, it, it's more than just, like I say, learning a technical skill. It's teaching students how to recognize the potential that technology has when it's applied properly to solve real world problems. So, for example, you know, when we do our United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which we do every year. So all of our school students will actually choose one of the uh, SDGs and they will you know, focus on a problem in the world and try to solve it. A lot of times they're using actually tech solutions, right? So technological disruptions to actually solve uh, you know, one of the, the, the problems in the world. And, and I think that's the kind of thinking that we want. So that later on, it doesn't matter what industry they work in. So whether they are doctors or med medical, you know, uh, you know, uh, whether they are, they, are, they are lawyers or engineers or businessmen or teachers or, or you know, accountants or financial analysts, whatever industry they go into, they are able to use the technology to actually gain an edge and you know, drive their own organizations to be more 4IR uh, you know, integrated. Okay, two last points before we end. Huh? So number one, is, number nine is entrepreneurship. Uh, so this is the nine skill that real schools will teach you know, your children uh, to help them succeed later on when they graduate. Now, this is really important because, I mean, the barriers to entry have fallen as a result of the fourth industrial revolution. I mean, now it's a lot easier to start businesses than it ever was in history, you know. And, and you know, uh, I mean, look, you could start an import-export business without even having a warehouse now. You know, I mean, you work with companies like Alibaba and all of that. A lot of this is virtual. You know, I, I'm sure many of your children you know, their dream is to be sort of become a YouTube star when they grow up, you know, they become a millionaire. And, and who knows, I mean, they may actually succeed. But I think this is important. And real schools, I mean, we, t we take a very different approach when we talk about teaching entrepreneurial skills to children. A lot of people, I think universities and schools, when they think entrepreneurship, for whatever reason, the focus tends to be on sales and managing money. You know, so a lot of it tends to be fundraising. Okay, so to them, entrepreneurship is okay, raising funds, selling lemonade, you know, and, and making money. But but really, uh, the essence of entrepreneurship, it's not so much the money. You know? It's more the ideas. It's more understanding consumer psychology. It's more identifying a need in a particular market or context that has not been met yet. So it, it's teaching children and uh, teaching students to look around and be observant. And when they look around and be observant, they realize, ah, I see a lot of people want this, but nobody is providing this. So how do I provide this? Then, of course, it's about having the management and the resourcefulness to put together a solution and then sell the solution for a price that people are willing to pay. You know, so that whole business model, then, of course, the marketing and the sales come into play. But, you know, my point is it, it's coming out with the ideas to begin with that is the difficult bit of our entrepreneurship, you know. And so uh, that's something we do. And, and you know, we, we often use examples, you know. And so when we're trying to inspire our own students at real schools to say, hey, look, you don't need to wait until you're an adult to actually be an entrepreneur. You can start right now in school. And this is something, of course, with the parents' consent that we, we actually encourage them to do. So uh, we give examples of, you know, I mean, this is Noah, Noah Mintz, you know, who is a 16-year-old girl who actually started an online babysitting service. Or George Mattis, who at 18 started a drone design company that is worth 28 million US dollars. Eh? So 
So that's four four times Malaysian ringgit, over 100 million, million with Malaysian. For Mosiah, who started a bow tie company, or Anya, who started a portable dialysis machine. So this is where our STEM program also is entrepreneurial. So we're not just teaching them how to do research in science, but actually teaching them how to use science to create a product that is going to make them millions of dollars, you know, or solve a particular real world problem. So now, of course, we're doing a lot of hackathons, you know, while we are in MCO lockdown, right? A lot of hackathons, a lot of competitions among our school students to invent products and things that are going to be relevant in this COVID-19 world. You know, so how do they come up with a product and service that meets a need that helps make their school environment safer, for example, when school does reopen, you know, in a few weeks' time? Uh, you know, so all of these are examples of entrepreneurs that have sort of, you know, made their mark. And, and we just want our real stud, uh, school students to know that, that they should have the confidence to do it themselves. Now, last thing I'm going to end with this, which is, you know, the 10 skill that we, you know, we, we teach all real stu school students is, is understanding themselves. So we call this self-knowledge. You know, I mean, it's no point that they understand the whole world if they don't know who they are. And, and the idea here is that, if they are to find their, their place in the world, right? So in order for them to live a full life, to live a happy life, they need to find a profession. They need to find a life career pathway that fits their own talents and personality and interests and their life goals. Then it means that they need to understand, you know? So they need to know what their talents are. They need to know what their personality is. They need to know what their interests and passions are. They need to know what they want in life, what are their goals, you know. And, and so I think this is probably the thing that is most lacking in schools. You know? You've got students who are straight A students coming out and they are incredibly smart, but they have no idea what they want in their life and they have no idea what they want to do in their life. You know, and I think that's the problem, you know. That, that's why there's so many working adults that are so unhappy with their jobs, with their careers, you know, uh, with their whole lives. Because, you know, at school level, they were not taught to think and discover themselves. And so to me, I think that's what made real schools different, you know. Our philosophy of school is that this is a place for talent development. This is a place where we want children to come and explore a lot of different things. That's why you look at our real curriculum on top of the basic curriculums. There are so many things we get them to do. Everybody does drama and music. Everybody does, you know, design technology, work with 3D printers, they work with their hands, do design thinking. All of them do technology. All of them do outdoor skills. All of them try being a leader. All of them do science and languages. And, you know, I mean, so everything, sports, you know. And, and, and so our job as a school is not to make their world smaller. It's to make their world larger. So our vision in real is to enlarge your children's world and help them discover this bigger world so that in the act of discovering the larger world, they also discover themselves. They also find themselves in the world. You understand? You know? They also then realize, okay, this is what I want to do with my life. And, and so that's why that by the time they're 17, 18, then they've got a much clearer sense of, you know what, this is what I want, you know, and these are my goals in my life. This is what I want to do with my life. So I think that that's the best present you can give your, your children, you know, I mean, to give them a school experience where they find themselves. And because they know who they are, you know, you know that they're going to live a happy life because they are very clear about what gives them that joy and satisfaction, right? So putting it all together, these are the 10 real world skills that, you know, we we include as core part of our education experience in real schools. Anybody coming to real schools, you know, you're, you can be assured your children will develop these 10 skills that are going to help them survive and thrive in our real environment. Now, just before we say goodbye, all right, I open up for questions, you know, please do go and, and check out our website and discover who we are, you know, find out about our 10 real worlds, and how we are bringing, you know, the real world into real. Uh, to, uh, go and go and find out about all of these things. Our digital world, and you know, the fact that Apple iPad School. What does that mean? Our robotics program. Uh, you know, our entrepreneurial training. Uh, you know, how we expose them to the bigger world, so the global. Uh, you know, to have a global perspective. You know, uh, how we do moral education and, and teach them how to develop moral courage, science. Languages, I mean, we're very strong in languages. Traditionally, real has always been famous in 
our English BM and our Mandarin program, you know, sporting world, all right, you know, uh, outdoor activities, uh, design innovation, you know, performing arts, psychological, so all of these things, uh, which are part of our core curriculum. And so all of our students actually get to experience all elements of this curriculum. Go and look, you know, I mean, our brochure has uh, details about how we do career guidance, uh, our real world simulations, you know, where we actually, you know, work with companies and universities and they, they help design with this simulations so, so that our, you know, students uh, get a sense of what it's like to be a lawyer, what it's like to be a medical doctor, engineer. So, I mean, they actually work on real life industry problems, you know. Uh, even the way we do our leadership programs are different. So rather than just have the prefects, you know, I mean, we've got a whole bunch of leaders and uh, sports leaders, community leaders, literary, literary leaders, performing arts leaders, event management, you know, media, tech innovation. So, I mean, you know, regardless of what talent your children have, there'll be some leadership group where they can exercise leadership in our school community. So, so again, we are, we are so proud of everything, you know, we are, we are doing in real. This is my contact, you know. Uh, details in case any of you want to email me a bit later on but what i thought at this stage is you know um if um you know if you have any questions all right you know um please do you know you you can type it out in the in the uh, i think the facebook messaging you know uh, box and i'm happy to take any questions all right uh, but thank you all for taking time to you know, uh, visit our virtual open days today, particularly in Shiraz and in JB, uh, but also the, the Shah Alam team is on standby. So if you want to talk to them as well, Dr. Jeffrey and his team are there. But I, I just want to give a special shout out to, uh, to firstly, Ms. Purley, uh, who is the academic head of Johor Bahru. You, you heard her a bit earlier on and her team in JB, they are doing a fantastic job, you know, transforming that school, you know, uh, based on the ideas that I've just shared about, I mean, you know, uh, so for those of you in JB, you, you have to go after the MCO ends, you 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 must, you know, uh, go and visit that JB school. I mean, it's an amazing campus, very beautiful green environment, but they've got fantastic facilities. They've just finished their culinary lab there. I mean, so for those of you who like Master Chef and stuff like that, you know, you should certainly go and uh, check that out. And also a, a special shout out to... Uh, Dr. Morali uh, from our real school's uh, Chiras campus. And uh, Dr. Morali and the team also are doing amazing work. You should go and check out their maker space and their art design, you know, space that they've got a whole center for, uh, you know, design technology and 3D printing and all of that. So uh, if you're anywhere near Chiras or Ulu Langat, Pajang area, you know, after the MCO lockdown, please go and uh, go and check out that, that Chiras school, right? So lots of exciting things. And, and uh, I often have told, you know, our leadership team and our teachers who are listening out there from real schools as well as our parents that, you know, I mean, we've made a lot of really exciting changes last year and this year to the campus facilities, to the curriculum. Uh, you know, we've brought in tech, Apple iPad program, lots of really you know, exciting things to move the school into this 21st century learning paradigm, uh, real education for the real world. But I often tell all of you that this is just the beginning, right? You know, I think the next three, four years, we've got a lot more exciting new ideas and partnerships that we are working on even now during the lockdown. I mean, we're having meetings every day with partners from all over the world. You know, so I, I, I you know, in the next few months, we're going to make a, a few more exciting new announcements about what else we are introducing to help prepare children for the real world. So uh, this is just the beginning. You know, even more exciting things to come in the next few years. Uh, and, and and so, you know, please do visit the schools for those of you who are, uh, you know, not part of our parent community yet. Um, uh, there's a question here. What are yearly out-of-school activities that the children can participate in? Well, I mean, look, that's an exciting thing. So for real schools, I, I want to answer that question in two ways. Eh? So thank you so much, uh, you know, uh, I think for, for asking that question. I think the first part of that question is I want to say this. You know, the unique thing about real is this. Eh? What other schools consider extracurricular activities, right? So things like outdoor, the outdoor, you know, activities, you know, camping, uh, you know, first aid training. Uh, by the way, we even do self-defense classes. 
uh, you know, the tech robotics programming, performing arts, drama. So a lot of these things in most schools, they would be considered after school activities. So extracurricular, very common, right? Everybody wants to know, hey, what's your extracurricular activities? What is your co-curricular activities? Now, first, I want to say all of the things that I've described in my talk, everything that is in our website, you know, all of these things, the technology, the robotics, the, the 3D printing, the cooking, right? Because we've got MasterChef cooking, culinary labs, you know, the cooking classes, the outdoor activities, the sports, the, all of this stuff, man is part of our core curriculum so that's number one we don't consider it extracurricular you know it's actually part of the curriculum all of our children all of our students will have it you don't need to pay anything extra it's part of the curriculum and it's part of the timetable right so that's number one that's that's the first thing that makes us very very different from other schools which is all of this extra stuff uh, the entrepreneurship the financial literacy i actually we, we put it in the school timetable we actually have a a period, a class called real time, where we put a lot of these extra stuff, right? So firstly, that's number one. So that's why most of our children, uh, before you even talk about ECC or CCA, they most of it, they, most of the time they don't need anything extra because our real world curriculum already encompasses most of these skills. Number two, on top of that, so icing on the cake, right? So on top of that, all right, then we also have, of course, a very rich whole curricular program. Uh, that we run, you know, in some schools, it's after school. In some cases, for younger kids, it's actually during school time. And we've got hundreds of these co-curricular activities. So it's clubs, societies, you know, on top of that. So children can then focus, if they want to, on a specific interest, right? So, so uh, you know, uh, thanks, I think, for, for asking me about the school activities. But like I say, the important thing to note is that, you know, most of these exciting activities are actually already part of our school curriculum. And the reason why we do that is because, you know, if we parked it under CCA or ECAs, only a few students get to do it. See? So that's why in, in, in many schools, only a few students get to actually go and join the scouts or the boys brigade and do outdoor camping. I mean, maybe 5 10%. The other 90% don't know anything about camping. So our approach in real is no such thing. Everybody has to do camping. That's why we make it part of the curriculum. And in the same way, I mean, some schools will have things like St. John Ambulance. Again, that's only like 5 10%. Will actually go out and learn first aid. The other ninety percent are all completely hopeless. Uh, you know they don't know how to do any life saving skills. But in our school, they are saying oh, everybody has to do first aid. You know it's part of the curriculum. All of our school children have to do. You know, uh, all of our school children will have to do tech. All of our school children will have to do programming, coding. All of our school children will have to do. You know, um, uh, what do you call it? You know, will have to do three D printing, right? So I think that's that's the you know, uh, I think that's the special thing. You know that no child gets left behind all right and and you know i i think that's what makes it special uh, because i mean that's something close to my heart because like i say i've got children of my own and and so whenever you know we design schools i always am thinking what would be good enough for my own children i mean how do i design a school curriculum that i'm happy sending my own children to and i've got very high standards when it comes to you know my ch children's education so i think the important thing is i, I want my children to experience everything so even the way we do performing arts and drama or music, you know, in a lot of schools, I mean, you know, the problem is that only a few students get to star, right? So most schools will have some sort of a musical performance or a concert. I mean, all schools will have that. Like. But I mean, in most schools, uh, you know, I mean, you have maybe about five or six of the kids that are the superstars, you know, they get talking lines. Everybody else are sort of like, you know, background trees. <laughs> with no talking parts at all, right? You know, and 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 so in the way we run, for example, our drama program is every semester, all right, as part of the drama curriculum, all of the children will have to perform something in small groups. So all of the children, you know, all of them will have to do whether it's a scene from Shakespeare or short drama or something like that, or they have to videotape a short play or a short, you know, film in their iPads. But all of the children are the stars. Isn't it? And in the same way, music, everybody will be part of the concert. Everybody has to play a musical instrument. Everybody has to sing something. So I think the idea here is that no, but no child gets left behind. You know? In sports, I, I forgot to mention this, our benchmark for graduation is all of our students before they graduate, so by the time they're 17 years old, must be able to run five kilometers right, without collapsing and must be able to do you know, uh, four laps of the 25-meter swimming pool. So all of them must learn how to swim, learn how to, you know, uh, 
uh, run. And that one we've said for everybody. So again, uh, it's not just you know the top athletes that get to enjoy sports. Everybody needs to have a certain level of fitness. So I think that, that that's what makes our real school, real world skill philosophy and approach a bit different like, from the rest. You know, we believe that everybody needs to develop these 10 real world skills. Nobody is left behind. So, so uh, you know, that, that, that's something that is really important. Uh, I'm looking at a comment here. You know, so a lot of you have written some really interesting stuff. Thank you so much. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, that's interesting. So uh, C.L. Chong has asked, you know, these skills are good and crucial. How uh, do the teachers integrate skills into the school curriculum? Uh, especially, I think you're asking for the national curriculum. So uh, Chong, let me just answer that in, in two ways. Eh? So I think number one, that's why we've realized, you know, not everything can be integrated into the traditional subjects, right? So I would say when we talk about these 10 real world skills, there are two ways to actually include them in a curriculum. Way number one is some of these skills can be integrated into the more traditional subjects we're teaching. So for example, when we talk about things like problem solving or thinking skills, that can that's something that should be in every subject. So whether I'm teaching Lhasa Malaysia or math or science or you know, technology or PE, you know, a good teacher will know how to force children to think for themselves. So the kind of homework assignments I give you, projects I give you, class activities I give you, especially during this MCO period now, for our secondary school, a lot of times we do a flipped classroom where the children have to do a lot of the work themselves before they actually start their virtual classes. So I think a good teacher for things like thinking skills, that's something that can be incorporated in everything. Digital mindedness is another good example where because we've got a one-to-one -one Apple iPad program now, the use of technology how to understand technology now that's something that all of the teachers use so even in PE I can tell you they use their iPads because they're doing things like timing so they do fitness their fitness apps so that part of their PE curriculum you know they're videotaping themselves for example exhibit a skill in volleyball that they've just learned and so they are videotaping of themselves coming up with a portfolio video of the different volleyball skills they've learned over the last one month now that's an example of using technology to enhance even the sports curriculum uh, and things like science and all of that, they use the technology, robotics, 3D printing, right? But of course, there are other things like outdoor activities that honestly can't be integrated into all of the other subjects. And so we actually, like I say, uh, Chong, have a separate subject called real time. Okay, So if there are certain skills that we find it's difficult now for teachers to uh, integrate, include into a normal subject like math, BM, science, you know, uh, Sejara, then what we do is that we've got a real time period every week, all right, for all of our students. And real time, they are actually specialist workshops and challenges that we give our children every week that will then ensure that they cover certain skill sets that are not included in the other subject areas. So, so we have been very careful uh, in looking at all of the different skill sets to ensure that it is covered somewhere. So whether it's covered, like I say, in the normal curriculum periods or whether it's a special standalone, I, I want to assure you, Chong, that I mean we will cover it like you know somewhere. And and of course the schools are evaluating this every week, every month, you know, to ensure that you know the children are actually exhibiting uh, you know, the outcomes that we want them to have. And this is something we're still working on, of course. I mean, the principals, myself, I mean, we, we are still in touch, you know, every week, every month to to evaluate. Are there other things we can also include? And and I mean, we are very open to ideas. So I mean, a lot of parents have actually come up to us because many parents are also in industries, working in, in you know different professions, and they've actually suggested ideas. Can you, Dr. Go, can you try this, try that? And look, our our uh, you know culture as a school is very, very open. You know, so in many cases, we've actually taken some of these ideas and said, thank you so much. You know, this is a great idea. We didn't think about this, you know, so thank you so much. This is something that we're going to do next term or next year, right? So, so I think we are very open to what else we can do to improve how we incorporate these real skills. But like I say, last year and this year, we are, we are trying something uh, that, to be honest, I've not seen any school do, not just in Malaysia, anywhere in the world, you know. And I visited schools all over the place from, you know, Europe and Finland to, to the UK to America to Australia, New Zealand, so of course, different parts of Asia, Singapore, you know, and, and you know, I think this idea of real world skills being taught alongside core curriculum, this is something that is, I think, very new and, and re uh, very fresh and revolutionary, right? So thank you so much for, for that question and comment, right? 
Um, thank you so much, you know, so all of you for sharing. I, I Well, it, it's close to being three now. So if there are no other questions, all right, if there are no other questions, I may, you know, end the session at this stage. Maybe just one last chance if there are any other questions anybody like else would like to ask. Uh, well, look, I mean, you all have my email address, which I, which I shared a bit earlier. So please feel free, uh, you know, uh, to uh, write in and uh, email me and comment. Uh, and I'm happy to, you know, I'm happy to reach out to you, you know, personally and, and answer your questions. But like I say, you, you must come and visit our schools. I mean, I, I think virtually we've tried to sort of showcase what's special about our schools, you know, why we are so passionate about education, all of the different exciting new things we're trying, right, in our schools to create this new, more engaging, fun experience for students. So when they come in, you know, every day, they sort of look forward to school because there's something fun, something that, you know, connects with them, like, you know. It's about doing school, like I said, in the 21st century, not doing school for the 1980s and 90s. You know, uh, it, it's about how do we, speak to this generation and so i, I that's why you know i, I want to you know uh, again thank and praise my school teams in shiraz jb and shah alam you know uh, they've worked incredibly hard this last two years you know to to put in place these new ideas this new curriculum starting things like the apple one-to-one -one ipad school and I know it's not easy, uh, you know, and that's why most schools, I guess, don't try it because it's so difficult, you know. Uh, in most schools, you know, I mean, the staff, the teachers, there's a lot of resistance, you know, nobody wants to change. I understand that, you know, I mean, as a psychologist, I know, you know, anything new is different, but that's the problem uh, with education. I mean, for hundreds of years, we have not had the courage to change. You know, we've not had the, the courage, bravery, the, the, the willpower to take the step to actually, you know, work to change the paradigm, change the way we teach, change the way we actually offer the curriculum. And, and you know, I mean, I know it, it takes an incredibly, you know, a lot of courage and a lot of hard work uh, to do that, right? You know, uh, there's a question by Audrey, you know, um, you know, how, how are the teachers trained? Uh, how do they adapt? So uh, again, you know, what we did last year was there was a lot of training. So for example, just to give an example of the iPad, you know, the fact that before last year and this year, you know, we, we none of us had, you know, used iPads or technology in the schools. I mean, we went through about four months of training, you know, with Apple. So we partnered with Apple Singapore, the regional. They brought in top trainers. We hired our our own uh, Apple training tech consultant who had many years of experience. This guy from New Zealand. And, and, you know, people like Robert Arpino from Apple, I mean, th these people are so helpful. I mean, so I just want to give a shout out to Apple because they really came in and partnered with us. But for example, for four months, we had training. So the teachers received their iPads four months before we implemented the program. And they went through, I think, about four training sessions. And between the training sessions, a lot more coaching. We, we had an ad tech coaching structure. So there were coaches in each of the schools, a lot of sessions a lot of trying, a lot of, you know, trial and error before we actually put the, uh, we, before we actually implemented the program this year. So I think, Audrey, that would be an example of our approach. Like, I mean, we realize it's not easy, uh, you know. I mean, for all of these kinds of things, you know, I mean, it takes a lot of training. So I think the short, the short answer to it is a lot of training and coaching, you know, for all of these things. So even our, all of these uh, skills that we're teaching, our digital tech program, we send our digital tech leaders for training, you know, they, they visited schools, you know, around the region, we brought in people like Apple, uh, other ed tech educators from around the region to come and give them ideas. For our martial arts training, we got professionals to come and do train the trainer programs. First aid training program, we brought in professionals. Our outdoor training program, we got professionals to come in and train the teachers. So I think the short answer to it is we did a lot of teacher training last year and the beginning of this year in order for them to be ready. And this is still ongoing huh? because, like I said, some of these programs are still being rolled out. So a lot of uh, continuing professional development for teachers. Right? Um, last year, we, we, we started the practice of every two weeks right, for two hours, all of our teachers have CPD programs. So, so just the commitment to set aside two hours, you know, so it's four hours per month, huh? and this is the whole year, 
You know, I mean, many schools, maybe they have one or two training sessions a year. I mean, we're talking about every two weeks, they have workshops and trainings for teachers in different areas. So whether it's use of technology, new pedagogy, new assessment methods, uh, you know, understanding new assessment methods to be in, in line with our school. So I, I think that's number one, you know. I think number two also, look, in terms of criteria for selection of teachers, I mean, well, aside from the usual, of course, I mean, we're looking at teachers who are qualified with some experience, but I mean, to me, I'm really looking on top of the, the, the basics. I mean, when I and the principals are interviewing the teachers and we're looking at the bio data and the resumes, I think I'm looking at a teacher that embodies these real world skills that I want to teach our students. You know, so what, what I shared earlier in the talk, now, those real world skills, adaptability, agency, you know, locus of control, EQ, you know, I guess I'm looking for teachers who exhibit some of those traits. Now, I know they're not going to be perfect. You know, I mean, I, none of us are perfect, but teachers who show me that they're committed to acquiring these skills, teachers who have the energy and the passion to teach you know, and therefore are willing to go the extra mile. So I'm looking for a certain energy level when we are interviewing teachers, a certain level of enthusiasm. Because like I say, even if they are rough around the edges, and look, I mean, it's going to be impossible to get teachers that have all the skill sets that we want, you know, because of course, many of them are coming from other school environments where they're not teaching these kind of things. I'm, I'm fine with that. But if they come in, then I need them to have the attitude that they're willing to learn. They are willing to acquire these skills. And they show me that they've got the intelligence to be able to learn these skills. And the energy and the enthusiasm that will sustain, you know, uh, that that kind of learning, then 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 I'm willing to take them on. So so I think Audrey, that's in question, uh, in response to your question, uh, you know. So how are we preparing teachers to actually deliver this? This that's a really good good question because you know without the teachers we can't do any of this, right? So like I say, one part, you know, uh, it, it's a lot of training. There's no substitute training, coaching, we invest a lot of time and energy into preparing our teachers. In fact, we are the only school, we even came up with our own teaching website. You know? So we've got a teaching resource page. In fact, it's public. All of you can actually log on to it. It's called Real Teaching. So Real Teaching at real.edu.my. And, and so it, it's uh, for, you know, because we, we've got a big group, of course. I mean, we've got 100 staff. I mean, uh, real education, real schools is part of a bigger group that is the largest K-12 group in Malaysia called Prestigion K-12, right? And we are, our chairman is Tunku Ali, who is also the chair, chairman of uh, Marlborough College, Malaysia, and uh, also the founder of Teach for Malaysia. So he's our new chairman. And, uh, you know, uh, Prestigion K-12, we've got 1,600 staff and we've got over 22,000 students because our part of our family is real schools. We also have Sri KDU school in Kota Damansara, and we're opening up another digital school in Klang. We've got real kids, right? So we've got 37 branches there and over 600 teachers in our kindergarten. We are the largest owner operated kindergarten group in Malaysia. And we've got Cambridge English for Life, and they've got another 10,000 students uh, in their English centers all over Malaysia. So this whole group, I mean, 1,600 staff, of which easily 1,300 are teachers. So we've actually set up our own website, even called Real Teaching, you know, and it's a it, it, it's a fantastic resource. We've got over four five hundred, you know, it's articles, it's links, it's videos, it's you know, we link up to many other resource websites, you know, all over the world, and and so our teachers have, you know, that kind of environment like, where we are doing everything in our power to empower them, prepare them, broaden their own horizons, uh, and support them. Right. Uh, so, so for example, during this COVID period, uh, we've actually engaged with um, you know professional mental health counselling centre uh, to provide any kind of counselling and mental health support for our teachers. So I think you know uh, the the short answer to that is you know we bring in teachers that we think are the best, best energy, best enthusiasm, you know, best you know this intelligence and passion, uh, and then we look after them. You know, and, and to me, any good old education organization, I mean, you have to look after your staff, you know, and, and support them, empower them, you know. And, uh, you know, of course, during this MCO period, it's not an easy trying time, but we've been trying our best to support our teachers, you know, and, uh, you know, give them further training because, you know, doing virtual classrooms is not easy at all. 
but also to support them and assure them that look, you know, we we, we back you and we have confidence in you, right? So um, the time now is two fifty nine. I, I think I need to say goodbye to everybody. You know, I've taken up my one and a half hours, but like I say, uh, somebody has posted. You know, one of my colleagues has posted the real teaching website there. So in that um, you know in that message thread, so you can log on to it. But uh, by the way, we've also got one for parents. Eh? So uh, you know. Um, I think I forgot to put that up, but if one of my colleagues can also put that up. So we've also got a parenting website because we see parents as our partners in this whole process of education, right? So, so you know, we also have a real parenting website, which one of my colleagues will put on that uh, message thread as well. And you, everybody can log on. There are about five, 600 articles now and a special section on how parents can support your children during this MCO lockdown. So please go to the website, uh, you know, like I say, we want to support our parent communities and we have parenting workshops from time to time. I think during this MCO period, you know, we've given about three parenting workshops. So you can go to our Facebook page and actually download some of the old uh, presentations. All right. So thank you, everybody. I better go because I know there are other programs that our Churras and our JB School have planned for you as part of their virtual open day. Please don't say goodbye. After I've ended my session, go back to the virtual open day page and, uh, you know, you, you can actually have a virtual session, a virtual tour. You can watch the videos of our schools and the exciting things they are doing there. But please, uh, after the MCO lockdown, go and visit the schools. All right. I'm hoping that by June, the schools will be open and you can go and visit them. Right? So thank you so much for your time and uh, all the best, everybody. All right. God bless. Stay safe.